Okay, good evening, everybody. It's so great to see everyone. I hope everyone had a great week. And I'd like to share it, learn with you a topic today that for me is um, very fascinating on many, many levels. Again, it says 8.30 in the poster, but we're back to we're at nine o'clock. I have a lot of thoughts going through my mind about Baruch Hashem. We opened up Mincha Mariv and how that, you know, that, that experience of, of coming back to Minyan, which um, not everybody is there yet. Um, um, and the people should do what they feel comfortable doing and what their doctors advise them in doing. But I have a lot to say about that, but I hope to write something up to um, express my thoughts. But tonight I'd like to discuss a different topic, but before we get there, I'd like to, we have many sponsors for this evening. I'm gonna go in backwards order. You'll understand why. Uh, tonight our learning is sponsored by the Naftali Aaron Learning Group to commemorate the Shloshim of Yaakov Meir Ben Baruch, our dear friend, Mr. Michael Friedman. Sponsored by the friends of our, another dear friends, Artie Weinstein, in memory of Avram Hirsch and Yosef Levy, a true friends of Natep and all of us. Sponsored by Sharon and Michael Glass. We see Michael here is on the line. In memory of the earth side of Sharon's father, Mr. Irwin Cohn Shlomo Ben Yosef Cohen. Sponsored by Levi Nishmas, Chana Reisel Bas Aaron David, Mrs. Anita and Ulster, another friend of our, uh, of our community, on her yurt side by her children. And finally, sponsored by my parents, Susan and Mitchell Markowitz and family, in memory of my grandfather. Uh, I'm named after my grandfather. My Hebrew name is Avram Eliezer. And uh, his 50th yurt site is oh. taking place this Shabbos. The Shabbos, Chaf Aleph Sivan. My father was very concerned if he was, if it was even going to be a Kaddish to be said on that day, which I know many, many people here were also thinking about when they had your sites coming up and they lost loved ones and um, he's appreciative. He's able to say Kaddish, we can't get together for a 50th year site. Uh, our family's gonna be doing something privately, but for me, Avram Eliezer Ben Baruch, my grandfather, has been somebody behind the scenes who has been a continuous inspiration <clears throat> to uh, my life, to my family's life. And, um, you know, I really feel that I always have you know, somebody else backing me up um, throughout my entire life, taking care of me, protecting me. Um, and that is, my, that is my grandfather, whom I never had the privilege to meet. But thankfully, he has over 10, 10 grandchildren and great-grandchildren, probably even more, I don't know the exact number, that are named after him. Most recently, two weeks ago, my cousin had a baby, and his name was Eitan Eliezer. Um, Avram is another name for Eitan, alternate name for Eitan. Um, in his memory. So learning Shasos and Eloi for all their neshamos, big on Eden Shamala. This evening, I'd like to talk to you about a topic, um, alternative history. The what ifs, this is a big topic. You know, um, we think about this both historically, you know, um, Dewey defeating Truman, the famous, um, you know, front cover of the paper that never really happened. What happened if the South beat the North in the um, in the Civil War, what happened if JFK was never assassinated? What if Moshe Rabbeinu was able to enter Eretz Yisrael? How would things be so different? Assassination of Hitler, would that have worked? You know, going back in time, the what ifs of history, alternative history, there's a lot of literature. Um, actually, there's a Jewish book, we'll get to it later in, um, in Russia, um, that it dedicates some time to this, to this concept. There's some Rishonim that address this too, and there's a lot of uh, secular literature discussing this specific topic of alternative history. And I like to frame, that's, that's what we're going to talk about tonight, alternative history, because it really touches on a very, very pressing point, point in our Parsha. In the middle of our Parsha, the most, maybe two of the most famous Pesukim in the Torah are, Vayhi bin Sarar and Vayomer Moshe, Kuma Hashem, Vayfutsu, Vayvecha, Vyanusim, Misanecha, Mipanecha, Uvenocha Yomar, Shuva Hashem, Rivivos Alpha Yisrael. And if you look at those two psukim on the right side of this page, you'll notice that bookending, those two psukim, we discussed it from a different angle this morning, are two inverted nuns. This is an exact copy of what the Torah, the Sefer Torah, would have over here. The two inverted nuns, we don't read those inverted nuns, but the, those inverted nuns are there. And we say these words every single time we open up the Torah. And every single, we open up the Aron to take out the Torah. And every single time we put back the Torah, we say these same words, right? But even so, when we open it up, and when we put it back, 
Now, what is so significant about these words? Yeah, it talks about the Aron. It talks about the Aron Kodesh. It talks about, so maybe, but is there a deeper connection as to why we need to mention these words every single uh, time we open up the Aron? Is there something here that Chazal want to teach us in this? And why are these inverted nuns here? What are they teaching us? So the Gemara in Maseches Shabbos says something very, very interesting. Very, very challenging also. By Yehibin Tzaraon, there are simonios. There are signs on each side of Yehibin Tzaraon. Why? To teach you? She'en zu mekoma. This is not the appropriate place. It doesn't belong. These two psukim don't belong here. They don't belong here. They belong somewhere else. Where else? Not for now. Where exactly they belong? It's a different discussion. But they don't belong here. They don't belong in this spot. And the Torah needs to testify to that notion that these two psukim do not belong here. And then continues the Gemara, Rebbe Omer, Rebbe Yehud Omer, Lo min Hashem huzeh, el misha sefer, hu chashev, hu Rabbi Yehuda Nashi says that it's not only that they don't belong here, but that this is a safer Torah unto itself. And the Gemara continues to elaborate on this and says that really, you all think that we have five Sifrei Torah. It is actually not true. That is not a fact. We don't have five Sifrei Torah. We have five, it's not Chamisha Chomshei Torah. It is seven, uh, seven Torahs. How do you know that? We have gracious Shemos Vayikra, by Midbar, up until these words, Vahibin Sauron, Vahibin Sauron are a safer Torah unto itself. The rest of Ba Midbar is another Torah, another Chumash, and then you have Devarim. Really, you don't have five, you have seven. That these two Psukim, they don't belong here, and they are safer, they are safer unto itself. They are Chashav enough on their own that they are safer unto itself. Now, what does this mean that they're safer unto itself? So the Baal Turim, the Baal Turim was the famous son of the Rush, one of the great Rishonim, Rabbeinu Asher. He wrote, Rabbi Yaakov ben Asher wrote the Baal Turim. And he writes something here, which at first glance sounds very cute. Sounds very cute. So he says, oh, you know what's the hint here? That, uh, that there are, these two psukim really encapsulate uh, our Torah unto themselves, or sacred unto themselves. Well, Vahibi Sora, if you count the words of the first Pasuk, uh, how many words are there in that first Pasuk? You can count while I, you know, continue on. There are 12 words in that first Pasuk. Interesting. And you know how many words there are in the second Pasuk? Uvenoch Yomar? There are seven. So those correspond to the first Pasuk in the Torah and the second Pasuk, and the last Pasuk in the Torah. The last Pasuk in the Torah has 12 words. The first Pasuk over here, Vahibi Tzoran, also has 12 words. The first Pasuk in the Torah, Bereshit Bar Lakim Shemaim Basaretz, Seven words. That corresponds to the second pasuk here. Just to make sure we're all not lost over here. Baal Turim says, how do you know this is a safer Torah into itself, these two psukim? Because each of the psukim encapsulates the amount of words that the first and last pasuk in the Torah have. Just like the last pasuk in the Torah has 12 words, so too the first pasuk, by Hebin Sarah here, has 12 words. Uvenocha corresponds to Bereshah's bara. Seven words, seven words. We're all good? What's the problem with that? Is there a problem with what I just said? It's cute, it's nice, right? And that's what Baltram says. Oh, there you go. It's a safer Torah to itself. What's the problem with what I just said? Okay, everyone's a little shy tonight. The Rotelika Komi Lublin. Robert, you got it? Yeah, no, like, I guess the problem is where are they getting that from? That's a, that's a very uh, strong statement. It's a very strong statement, right? So he's, they're building off of the Gemara. So that's the Gemara says the Masora that this is a safer Torah to itself. They have a, a smach, a remez, a hint for this over here. Ratzada Kokomi Lublin, one of the great Hasidic Rebbes, very, very different type of thinker. He died in 1900. He quotes his Baal Turim. He says, I'm bothered by this. You know why? Because if this is really a safer Torah to itself, then it should follow an order. It's actually out of order. The first Pasuk in the Torah Voracious bar lokim as shmaim as ours. How many how many words? Seven. So the first pasuk here should have seven, and the last pasuk should have twelve, corresponding to the last pasuk. It's actually itself. It's inverted. It's backwards. It shouldn't be that way. Rav Tzadok himself was very bothered by this. He says there's something. There must be something deep to what Balatrim is saying. I don't get it. It's very difficult because it's even backwards in terms of what he's trying to express. 
Now, I'm gonna hopefully we'll we'll learn tonight something deep about this. But before we get there, I'd like to share two pieces of alternative history that are just fascinating. Uh, one is there's a great article from ESPN.com um, a few years ago. There's no basketball playoffs now, so let's shame the basketball playoffs. Where they had a great line. There was a foul that was called in the middle of the game. I believe LeBron James was playing in that game, and there was a foul that was called in the middle of the game. They triggered a replay, and the whole replay and the whole you know the whole foul changed, altered the game. And eventually, I don't remember the details, altered the entire, the entire series. So there's a great line here. If we read the second paragraph over here, it says, in an instant, right? The crisp, clean, clean game spirals into turmoil. Because what's going to be? You're going to follow what they just said. They passed him, the ref passed him. We're going to follow what the replay says. And seemingly, every NBA fan online on a couch in a sports bar and glued to a device transforms into an amateur replay official interpreting the grammar legalese of the NBA rulebook. Everybody was talking about this the next day. Now, this is the key line here for us. A digital campus of Talmudic basketball scholars, right? We love as Jews. We analyze, we challenge, we, we figure out all details, right? What happened? Sarah's here with us tonight too. Uh, what happened and what could have happened as well. And actually, somebody was taken to task for this. In 1976, Rabbi Lamb, we discussed Rabbi Lamb last week. He found a tradition at the age of 28, right? At the age of 28, he founded the journal Tradition. In 1976, on the heels of the loss of the Yom Kippur War, a big discussion, did we really lose the war? Did we not lose the war? We lost a lot of people in the Yom Kippur War. Gary Epstein, uh, who was a lawyer, wrote, I was, uh, his, his son was my counselor in Kent Morasha, um, wrote an article about theoretical alternative history. What if the Jewish, Jewish people lost Israel in the Yom Kippur War? What would happen? What would it be? Can the Jews of the modern Jews in the 20th century, can they survive without Israel? It's an interesting question. So somebody um, wrote an article about Rabbi Philip Zimmerman from Long Beach, wrote an article in the next um, journal, blasting him. How dare you discuss these possibilities that don't happen? Judaism, halacha, mitzvot, Torah, we are in the reality right now. We're not in the theoretical. Leave that to your basketball games. Leave that to alternative, not, not to Torah and Judaism. We don't discuss that way. It's mind boggling and gross and disgusting and very strong language that he writes over here. I'm happy to share with you the rest of the articles, but you see how this is like a, this is a, a sensitive topic, whether we didn't, we're going to discuss this over here, alternative history. And you think about it, right? Why do we have alternative history? Why, why, why do we even discuss it? And this is something that people discuss. What would be, right? Or Chaim HaKadr discusses, what if Moshe Rabbeinu would have entered Eretz Israel. What would be? What would be? And there's an article, there's a, there's a book, you can get it on Amazon, it's pretty expensive. It's called The What Ifs of Jewish History, from Abraham to Zionism. And he has about 15 chapters about different what ifs in Jewish history, uh, written by Dr. Gabriel Rosenfeld. And in the introduction to this book, he asks the question, right, that every author usually asks in his, their introduction, why am I writing this book? Why is this necessary? What is this accomplishing? What is my goal over here? So he, he, he suggests three different reasons why people discuss and are bothered and intrigued by this question of alternative history. And he has three approaches. The first two, you know, I didn't quote here. The first one is it's causation. We're trying to figure out what led to, you know, what led to why. Did X lead to Y? Did Z lead to Y? What led to this, you know, reality that we have right now. So if this didn't happen in the past, would we still have this, right? Um, mention uh, Rabbi Lamb. So there was, a, there was an article that came out from a Jewish publication called The Blair House a bunch of years ago about somebody that wrote, what if Rabbi Lamb never became the president of YU? It was very, 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 very fascinating, very, very interesting. So some, it's causation. Would this, would this end up being the same? That's the way some people understand it. Other people, he gave a second answer, it's appreciation. And if you look at appreciation, right, you appreciate what you have if you know what, what could have been the alternative of what you have right now. And that's very important. I think if you look at, reflect on our Pesach Seder, or we have a, something that we sing at the Pesach Seder that could be a reflection and reality of alternative history and appreciation, appreciating what we have. We call it Dayenu, right? Dayenu is like alternative history. If we only got this, we would still be happy. We would still be thankful to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, right? So there are different reasons why we have this notion of alternative history. 
But then he goes to a third, a third idea. And this is very, very beautiful. And he says here, what, what is it really that? What does it really bother people? And he says the third and perhaps primary reason why we ask what if lies in the broader area of human psychology. It's in our very nature as human beings to wonder what if. At various junctures in our lives, we speculate about what might have happened if certain events had or had not occurred in our past. What if we had lived in a different place, attended a different school, taken a different job, married a different spouse? When we ask questions such as these, we're really expressing our feelings about the present, right? Are we comfortable with where we are right now? Are we okay? Are we happy, right? With where we are right now in our lives. We're either grateful that things worked out as they did, or we regret that they did not occur different, did not occur differently. The same concerns are involved in the realm of counterfactual history, right? And then he goes on. But this is such a beautiful and profound foundation and it's deep, deep insight into human psychology that we think about this, we grapple with this. What if I had that job? What if I didn't go to that party and meet that girl, right? What if I, you know, just a day later, it's, it's amazing. I was on a, listening to a, a call the other night and somebody said that um, he decided to, he made Aliyah and he decided to move back to America to, um, to change things up. And um, a day later, somebody called him off for a job in Israel. He said, sorry, if you were a day earlier, literally a day earlier, I would have stayed in Israel. But now I sold all my things. I'm done, right? And you always think, what if, what if, what if that didn't happen? So Rabbi Salvechik says something so beautiful. He says here, it's a beautiful essay from Rabbi Salvechik in general, but he says here, what was going on? This is one of Sarah's favorite pieces of Torah. Um, what was going on in, in uh, Parshas Baloscha? So if we read the beginning of Parshas Baloscha, what was going on? The Jewish people were getting ready to enter the land of Israel. The, they were setting up the formation. The formation was getting ready, right? How do we know that? That's what it says. So explaining how they're going to go in. The army was set up. The Levian were finally counted. Everything was getting ready to the extent that Moshe told his father-in-law, come on, come on, we're going, we're going, we're ready, we're ready, we're going in. Everything was there, everything was set, and then things change. What happens? Right after these psukim of uh, Vahib and Sa'ara, what happens? Things go bad. The people start complaining. I want this. We want food. I want, I want the man to taste like that. We want to go back to Mitzrayim. People start complaining and Hashem has to take it back. They no longer have, go into the land of Israel. And says Rabbi Salvechik in, in, in an article, in a book called Vision of Leadership, the inversion, right? This, the essay is called The Inversion of Jewish History. He says here, why are these upside down nuns here? Why then would the Torah insert the verses into a section within which they would stand out, at, at, out as out of context? The Torah, he writes, is always about con connectivity, smichos, development, transition in its narratives. And here, yet here, it's totally out of order. It's totally out of order because it's misplaced. So it was supposed to belong here. The Hebrew Torah was supposed to reflect this notion that the Jewish people are entering the land of Israel with the Torah entering first. And how beautiful that scene would be if that's the way it would happen right now in the beginning of Sefer Ben Midbar. But it didn't happen. And the parsha of Ahibin Sa'aron did not seem misplaced before the great reversal took place. Before the Jews alienated God, before they fell before him, before they had doubts and sent the spies. Indeed, it was the continuation of the great story of the final triumphant messianic march into the land of Israel, which was supposed to take place approximately 3,500 years ago. There would have been no inversion and no need for an inverted notice. But a Kaddish Baruch wants to remind us that things didn't happen the way that they were planned. Life changed. There is an alternative history. The upside down doesn't represent the alternative history of the Torah itself. It was then, he writes, Vahi bin Sar Haron lost its place. Instead of the march bringing them closer to the land of Israel, it took them away from the promised land. The Nerns were inverted, and with the inversion, Jewish history became inverted, and it is still, in a certain sense, inverted. The parsha is still dislocated. We cannot say we are setting forth. We do not yet have the base of Mikdash. We do not yet have, we have not yet experienced a Geula. With the same assurance and certitude that Moshe displayed to his father-in-law just 24 hours before, the permissive multitude inverted the process of redemption. And that's why the upside down downs are there to remind us of what could have been, but also at the same time to appreciate the reality that we have. And that's back to our question from Rotsadok. Rotsadok asked, 
uh, an acute, acute idea from the Balaturim. Why is the first Pasuk the end of the Torah, the Hebe Sarah, in 12, 12 words, and the end of it, Uvenocha Yomar, seven, which is the first, to teach us the following. When things don't pl- plan out, the, go, go the way that we plan them out. When things don't go the way that we expect them. So for many people, you know what that is? That's an inversion. That's an ending. That's a self. That's a depression. That's sadness. But what does the Torah say? Uh-uh-uh. Every end could be a new beginning. Every ending, it may look like an ending. It may look like a finality, but that there always is an opportunity for another beginning, for another beginning. That's why he means our own. It's inverted. It shouldn't belong there. Things messed up. We messed up. But he is our own. It's 12 sukkim. The beginning, the end, is really now a new beginning. It's a new history. We charted ourselves a new history in this world. Klai Yisrael, that's what we did. And I say this, and I think this message for me resonates with me a lot, a lot, especially today. This is mentioned also, fast time, Nachamu, Nachamu, Ami, the Zohar writes, Nachamu, Nachamu, comfort, comfort my people. Nachamu, Nachamu starts with two letters, the same letter, the nuns. The Zohar writes, that refers to the inverted nuns. The true comfort is to know that one day the nuns will come back. One day the inversion is going to come back. We will ultimately have, we'll have the ideal state. We'll have the gu'ula. But when we reflect on this, you know, and as many people are pondering what's going to be, we don't know. Think about the Jewish people in the desert, how it was. At this very moment, they were living in an idyllic state in the desert. They were living for one year by Har Sinai, soaking up Moshe's Torah, soaking and basking in the presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. How amazing that was, and that experience. And then all of a sudden, they need to move. They need to travel, and there's complaints. Things change. And it's not so simple. You know, and when are they going to move next? And when are they going to go next? And where are they going to go afterwards? And how long is it going to take? You know what? They don't know. They simply don't know. Let's ask Moshe, our leader. Maybe Moshe knows. Moshe says, I don't know either. I move when the clouds move. And then I blow the shofar. And then we move more. And we very much connect to that notion and those feelings that the Jewish people felt in the Nidbar. As we're slowly moving, very gradually, to a place that we don't know where we're even moving to, where there's an unknown. So many unknowns. We have more unknowns in our life right now than we ever have had before. Ask 10 doctors. You make no offense, Dr. Karp. You'll get 10 opinions, right? We, we don't know. We don't know. And maybe perhaps that's to remind us that ultimately, maybe we were never in control before. A Kaddish Baruch was in control. And maybe that's one of the messages over here. But I believe Rav Tzadok's line takes, us, takes it to heart. Every end that we are perhaps mourning at this moment, every end or every dream that we've had for these past few months and into the next few months, every chassan and kala that dreamed of the wedding that they wanted, and bar mitzvah boy and bar mitzvah girl, vort simcha, bris, woo. every end could be a new beginning. Could be a new adventure. Summer morning, summer camps. Summer morning, summer vacations. V'chule, v'chule. And the inverted nuns remind us, it's not a bidi eved. We're not living a bidi eved. We're living the life that the Kaddish Baruch Hu wants us to live. And we shouldn't be passive in the decisions that we make and in the way that we live it. Every day we have the choice that we can live the life through the choices that we make in a proactive manner. I wish everybody a good Shabbos. It should be a Simcha Dik Shabbos. We should experience the Menuch of Shabbos. Be'ez Rad Hashem, here in Fairlawn, we're going to be having some Minyanim um, over, over Shabbos. And Be'ez Rad Hashem, many, many more. We should experience um, true Simcha together. Be'ez Rad Hashem, very, very soon. Amen. Good Shabbos. Amen.